I know that you wrote a book uh, called The Faith in the Halls of Power, where you explore the growth of uh, influence on the part of evangelicals in America, and you found uh, that influence everywhere, right. in Hollywood, in Wall Street, in uh, Washington. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you discovered that um, evangelicals are in very high levels of power, yes. that they're wielding great influence, but also that they kind of uh, stay sometimes below the radar. Yes. And um, that uh, it, it's, it's, they're more and more powerful than most people think, and that they're different from the other culture, which is, uh, you know, the, the mainstream evangelical culture that you see on television, the televangelists, uh, right. the, the Christian TV stuff, uh, some of the Christian films that are made that are a bit mediocre at times, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And you, I, I think you, you speak admiringly of uh, those leaders. All in all, your exposure to them, you know, gives a sense. Of, you know, one, one of the concerns that I had uh, as I read some of your, your work and uh, regarding that, and one of the thoughts that came to my mind was, uh, you know, well, if uh, these, the, these leaders, uh, they're so influential, they're so powerful, they have so much money. And I, sometimes when I, when I look at a place like Harvard, for example, you know, I, I, I studied there, uh, did my PhD at Harvard, and uh, the one, one case I can use, the, the bell tower at uh, one of the halls there was uh, uh, renovated in it to the tune of like $10 million, just a tower. Yes. Uh, for, for one of the halls. Uh, it's a huge thing, but uh, it required a lot of money. And somebody donated that money. I see chairs being endowed for right. $50 million, $20 yeah. million. Uh, huge amounts of money given by secular people. I wonder also how many of those people might be Christians and perhaps even evangelicals. Yes. And, I, and I've often, why don't they donate instead to a, Christ, a, a genuinely sort of orthodox, uh, bona fide evangelical college and why isn't there more money flowing, more influence being expressed, I think, at the level of uh, corporate culture and so on, by some of these very highly developed uh, evangelicals? It leads me to wonder, I mean, are, are these evangelicals being as, um, how should I say, as pure or as passionate about espousing their views in a prophetic sort of way mm. in those uh, halls of power that they occupy? And are they... Uh, really um, expressing a Christian stewardship and uh, commitment mentality in the way that they distribute their funds, in the way that they uh, wield uh, their influence, in the way that they run risks. Because, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a pastor here in the city of Boston, and, and it's always astounding to me how many evangelicals there are in all kinds of places, in City Hall, in, in uh, the state uh, house and uh, major hospitals, and yet, you know, that, that influence is not felt. Hmm. I think a lot of these believers feel that in order for them to be true citizens of the 21st century, they need to keep their faith separate from what they do. Hmm. They need to be very respectful of the privacy of others and the beliefs of others, which I agree with. But at the same time, I think what that does is that it keeps uh, the potential influence that the evangelicals can have somewhat muted and underutilized. And uh, I just wonder, though, how, how, how much of a need there is to foster a more militant kind of evangelicalism at the same time that we do try to retain that element of uh, that cosmopolitan viewpoint as well, that respect for diversity, mm. respect for privacy of others. Mm. The need to sometimes, yes, yeah, separate your faith to a certain degree from the stuff that you do, the work that you do, uh, and be respectful of the s resources that have been placed at your disposal for your stewardship and not for your control. But I guess I'm, I don't want to muddle too much the, the point of my, my thoughts. Again, is how can we uh, make sure that the, the young minds and sensibilities that are produced by Gordon that will go into these halls of power at some point really become uh, elements of salt and light, yes. militant and at the same time uh, nuanced elements of influence in the culture that we inhabit. Well, one of the things that, that w I try to be pretty intentional about is bringing people uh, into contact with our students that are good role models, who can inspire them to do something different and who can uh, help raise or expand their horizons of the possible. So I interviewed a lot of amazing people while I did Faith in the Halls of Power and uh, it was a great project. I got a chance to meet some amazing people. As you say, a number of them are not as generous as they ought to be. A number of them are not as connected to the local church as they ought to be. Um, 
what I choose to do is to really focus on those folks who I think are great examples to our students who can help inspire them in all the right ways. So, for example, last uh, spring we had Brady Anderson, who is the administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, one of the most significant agencies of uh, funneling federal dollars that exists. And uh, it, it's an environment that traditionally is a pretty secular context. Brady had been a Bible translator in Africa, a missionary for many years, a different profile. He was a, a lawyer, and he had first met Bill Clinton when they were in the Attorney General's office in Arkansas years ago. And President Clinton appointed him to be our ambassador to Tanzania, and, and then uh, he was more su successful as an ambassador, and then it was time for him to appoint somebody to head USAID. He chose Brady Anderson. Brady is a great example of someone who I think has learned how to navigate those secular environments of power while still being really true to his core Christian convictions. Mm -hmm. And students need to see that up close. They need to actually understand how does that relate to how you spend time with your family and you're working really long hours? How does it relate to how you spend your money? One of the things that I really am curious about when I'm interviewing great leaders is how much money they give away, but also how, how they limit their lifestyle. So Ralph Larson, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, he made a decision out of his Christian commitment that as he moved up in uh, the company, he would not change houses. So by the time he was CEO of this Fortune 50 company, he was still living in the three-bedroom, two-bathroom, split-level house in mm -hmm. suburban New Jersey. And he said, because I wanted my kids to have um, a, a sense of grounding. We didn't want them to, to get off kilter. I really respect that. And so those kinds of leaders are the ones that I'm bringing to campus. And the hope is that our students will be able to pick up from their experiences and, and hearing their stories some great role models.